and we have to start the 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 things with a uh, muted microphone. So it seems like we are live now for real. Hey everyone, uh, uh, welcome to the uh, the first Logic Apps live in uh, uh, 2023. Hopefully that's going to be like a, a monthly uh, event from now on. And as I'm here with Kent uh, uh, and Alex from the product team, and we're going to be uh, starting that now. So Kent, Alex, if you guys want to say hi. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for joining. So let's take a quick look at the agenda. Can you feel the uh, move the, the, the slides? Uh, yeah, it should be up. Oh, there we yeah, go. There we okay, go. it's a little bit of a delay. Yeah. <laughs> Not a problem. So uh, uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the, uh, the, the new team. We have like a, a couple of new people on the team. Some people left. Not everyone is here today, but uh, uh, we're going to, to uh, just go through who uh, uh, the PM team looks like. Then we're talking about a new initiative that is Logic Apps uh, uh, Aviators, right? Uh, uh, that community call is part of that initiative, but we have other things, and Alex is going to be talking a little bit more about that. I'll talk a bit uh, about the ICE retirement that is uh, uh, now in process. Then Kent is going to take and, and talk about a couple of things that are between GA and Preview. And finally, uh, uh, Alex is going to be talking a bit about uh, the, uh, the data mapper. And I know that a lot of people is interested on that. So without uh, uh, further ado, we can do our own introductions when we're showing the team. That should be coming up soon. It's like minus 27 in Canada here. So I think the internet pipes are a little bit, uh, a little <laughs> bit slow today. Not a problem. Do you want me to, to the, the, uh, swap to my one? Yeah, sure, if you don't mind, because I clicked the button a couple seconds ago. There we go. I think we have the technology. Look at that. Yeah. Cool. So the, uh, we're going to see some uh, familiar faces here on the team, some new faces, and, and some faces that are not with us anymore. But uh, the, uh, just to, to go through who you can find around the Logic Apps uh, uh, today, we have Slava Kotovic, that is our principal group PM. Uh, uh, Alex, that is the, the, the uh, uh, newest uh, addition of the band. And Alex, I'll let you introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Alex. I'm a recent grad from UW. And so I just recently joined the Logic Apps team. Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Focusing on data mapper, as you'll hear later, um, DevOps and our community outreach program. <laughs> Thanks, thanks, Alex. Yeah, so Divya is another one of our, our PMs. She's not able to join today, but a lot of you know her that, uh, from all the work that is doing with the enterprise verticals and the, uh, the, the connectors. Harold is not a, a join as well, but he's a, a, a focusing on IBM integration and making sure that all those uh, legacy can work now on, on the new world of Logic Apps and, and uh, Cloud. Kent usually doesn't need introductions, but I'll let him uh, introduce himself. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kent Weir. I'm a PM on the team focused around our enterprise integration strategy, uh, working on some features such as custom code, which you'll hear about in a future edition of this uh, event. Uh, observability, tracking, monitoring, those are some other areas I'm focused on as well. Mm -hmm. Thanks, man. So Pat is going to be looking uh, uh, on the whole UX and, uh, the, uh, and, and the designer, right? So he's currently in, in India, so not be able to, to join due to time zone. And finally, you have me, Wagner Silveira. So I'm working with the, the, the Logic Apps team, especially around the, 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 developer, uh, the, the developer experience, the DevOps, and also community outreach, so which this is one of the, the items. So next on the agenda, let's talk a little bit about Logic Apps Aviators. Alex. Uh, you're on mute. Bing. Good catch, good catch. <laughs> Anyways, um, we're thrilled to announce the launch of Logic Apps Aviators, our new community initiative. 
the goal of this program is to provide a space for our integration enthusiasts to easily come together and kind of connect as a community. It gives members a chance to share their knowledge and content with other passionate individuals while simultaneously learning with them. So as the aviators community grows, we do plan to offer more opportunities for gatherings and content promotion. But for now, we're eager to kick off this initiative with a live community stand-up and newsletter every month. Similar to today's event, we will be hosting live community stand-ups on the fourth Thursday of every month. So every live community stand-up will have different content and opportunities. So keep up to date and join us at aka.ms slash LA Live, as you can kind of see in the link up there. As well as starting March 6th, we will be publishing our Logic Apps Aviators newsletter to tech community on the first Monday of every month. Um, you can expect to see Microsoft and Azure Logic Apps related news, updates, and announcements from our product team, as well as spotlights on blogs, videos, and more from our enthusiastic community members. So make sure to check out this end of month introduction newsletter with the link provided to kind of get a taste of what's to come. But before we can even get started with celebrating the work done's community, we need content to share in the first place. So we encourage you to use the hashtag Logic Apps Aviators when sharing your work so that we can easily find and showcase it in our monthly newsletter. And we're very eager to see the fantastic content that our Aviators family will create and share. Awesome. Yeah, so remember that uh, keep track of that tag and start to share in your content with that, right? So we can, we can find it, uh, uh, celebrate all of that. So next on the agenda, ICE retirement. So we, we the, the, uh, announced the retirement of the, the integration service environment in October last year. And the retirement is going to, to be uh, happening in August, 2024, right? So there is still some time, but depending on how big it is, your, the, uh, your footprint on ICE, you needed to start working on that. We've been uh, working the, uh, uh, together with the team here to make sure that everything that you needed, both for export, but also to support your workloads on ICE in Logic Apps uh, uh, standard already by end of March, right? So this gives us like a, a little bit of how we are with the Connect Parity and also how the export tooling that we have created is uh, uh, working. You probably see between uh, uh, September last year and now, a number of things that is already been available. You have the file system connector now supported in ASCV3. So if, you, if you're using built-in file systems is available there. You should be uh, uh, able to use XSLT 2 and 3, including custom assemblies available now. We have a, a whole number of uh, uh, connectors that can be converted to built-in already including Key Vault, FTP, Azure Files, among some others, right? And uh, uh, in January, we marked a lot of our built-in connectors, SGA, just showing that we actually did, uh, uh, getting that to that level of uh, maturity on the tool. Uh, for people that is interested on uh, SAP, you're going to see that SAP is right now uh, uh, in public preview with RFC, but you also bring in the rest of the parity of SAP available. So you have things like uh, uh, IDOCs, sessions, uh, the, uh, BAPIs being uh, worked on. We are also working on service bus peak lock for stateful. So we can complete the parity on both sides for uh, uh, logic apps standard and some others, right? So the idea is by the end of March, 2023, we should be having the, the uh, that connector parity and the export tool ready for you to use to start removing those workloads. Talking about the export tool, right? So what is that export tool? We have a, a, a new tool available on Visual Studio Code that allow you to export both ICE or consumption uh, uh, workflows, right? The whole thing is centered on, on Visual Studio Code because then it will give you like a, a, a a set, a package that's ready for you to test locally, to adjust as you uh, as you want, and then to plug in onto your, your CI CD pipeline instead of doing like a production to production migration. Uh, we're going, if you wanted to, to see a little bit more about the, the, the how it works, we have two, uh, uh, two walkthroughs. 
one for ice and one for standard on those links there. I'm going to be putting that in the comment section in a minute. But uh, uh, let's take a quick look of how that is working in Rio. So fingers crossed for our first uh, demo. So we here on the Logic Apps, we here on, on the Visual Studio Code, right? And as part of the Logic Apps standard, uh, the Logic, uh, Logic Apps standard extension, you're going to find a new button that is export Logic Apps. When you click on that one, you're going to start a, a wizard-like process that allow you to find out what Logic Apps do you want to export and uh, and it's going to be doing some pre-validation for you. So it only exposes the things that we know that is going to be working on your environment, right? So in, in this case, I'm going to be looking for one of my subscriptions. And that one is going to be Logic Apps Demo. Inside Logic Apps Demo, I could find if I have any integration service environment, it will be showing here. And that's how we're going to be differentiating exports from ICE versus exporting from consumption, right? Just to give an example, if I select Logic Apps uh, uh, PM, you're going to see like a whole lot of integration service environments plus the regions. So today I'm going to concentrate on just the uh, uh, export for consumption. So using Logic Apps demo, I use Australia East. That is where I deploy all my Logic Apps. And that's one, one important point you'll be able to export all the logic apps in an ICE or a region, right? So if you have things that are deployed in multiple regions, you might need to run this process a couple of times. Once you do that, it's going to show all the logic apps that has available on that subscription and that region. For me, I have three logic apps there. You should be able to search for, for like some specific logic apps or you are able to go and find which resource groups, if you have more than one, your logic apps are. So you have a little uh, different ways to, to find those logic apps. So I'll select all those three and see if they are ready, they be able to be exported by the tool. So what you're going to find here is that I have three different, uh, uh, three different types of validation. Sometimes, my Logic Apps is still not ready to export. For example, the Logic Apps Demo 3 has an issue because the API management is still being, the, the work for the API management built-in connector is still being completed. So since we don't have parity on that yet, we're not going to try to export and you're having a, break in, a, a, a broken environment. So that Logic Apps is not be able to export. The next one that's Logic Apps uh, Export Demo 1, is fully exportable. So every single operation and parameters there can be exported. The last one that is a, a, a LE export demo two is showing that the security parameter has an issue, but not something that is going to uh, stop you from exporting, right? So in, on that one, what it should say is that is a, a security parameters are going to be exported, but you need to have a manual process there later on. If you have logic apps that cannot be exported, you'll not be able to continue, but it's just a matter of coming back and removing the logic apps that you're not able to export. It revalidates and now it's ready to go, right? So also having that, you're going to be able to just select a place where your logic apps is going. And in my case, I'm going to be using something that I created here earlier, LA demo, select that folder. If I have any managed connectors, I can simply click here and uh, uh, choose where the new managed connectors or Azure connectors would be deployed. On that particular case, uh, that is a, a simpler case. I don't have any anything, but uh, I'll just go in and continue with the export. So, as part of that export, what they did is downloaded the package, unzip it, and at the end of that, I have a Logic Apps standard project ready for me to run, right? And you're going to find all the details about what happened on this readme file.
when it decides to open. Come on. Okay. I'll show I'll show the, the the base here. So you're going there we go. It's taking your time. Oh, forget it, let's come back here. So it shows all the logic apps that's being exported. It shows like what is the extra required steps that you have, and also give you some details where uh, uh, if you have any infrastructure or uh, uh, connections where the, the, the files would be, right? So that is going to give you like a full uh, project, all parameterized, ready for you to be deploying on other environments. I'm not going to uh, uh, and show a lot more of that because we still have a lot of content to go. So I'll go back to the, the, uh, to the presentation. But if you have any questions about the export of ICE in general, let me know and I can share that. Uh, uh, I can reply that uh, later on. So let's go back to the presentation and pass it on to. Ah, there we go. Pass it on to, to Kent. Sounds good. Thanks, Wagner. Uh, so we, what we've got uh, rolling out here uh, right now actually is extension object support for Azure Logic Apps in standard. And so for some of you folks familiar with BizTalk, you may have, you might be familiar with this term called extension object. What it is, is essentially metadata that helps the runtime locate and load dependent .NET framework assemblies during map execution. And so this is particularly of importance when you do have a BizTalk map that uses the scripting functoid and is referencing that .NET assembly itself. Now, for those of you that have started to move BizTalk maps into Logic Apps, you're going to be quite familiar with the validate map gesture that will generate the underlying XSLT for a BizTalk map. Now, what you may not have noticed is that whenever you do that and you have a reference to a .NET uh, assembly, that there's another file that comes along with it. And you can see that it's highlighted uh, just underneath it. It's an XML file. And this XML file basically is the hint that the runtime uses to load the correct assemblies. And so in Azure Logic App Standard, now what we're providing you is the ability to provide this data along with your map so that you can go ahead and upload an XSLT file that references .NET Framework assemblies without the need to go ahead and tweak the XSLT itself. Back in November, when we initially launched this feature in public preview, you had to do some tweaking, I would call it, in order to instantiate that assembly and then also include some import statements. And now this is something that is available um, in our experience itself. So with the exception of the database functoid and the cross-reference functoid, you should expect you can just lift and shift your BizTalk maps into Logic App Standard and be able to use it. Now, uh, as I mentioned, this is rolling out now. So this is in the middle of our deployment train. Uh, do look for a blog post on Tech Community uh, when this actually launches, but it should be you know, shortly within the next week or so. Uh, so we can jump to the next slide where there is a demo and we walk through this. Also of note that this is available in both um, you know, VS Code and then also Portal itself. Now, one of the things that you do need to enable uh, for this to work is essentially the enable multi-language worker feature flag that will allow this .NET framework assembly to run uh, during execution. So as we start to do more and more things with .NET framework inside of Azure Logic Apps, that is a feature flag that uh, you'll get familiar with. It is something you need to manually enable, but it is something that will be available by default uh, in the future itself. And we'll just let the, the demo catch up here. Oh, uh, no, Wagner, I think it was moving. It was just. Uh, so we're going to have to let this play again. Uh, another thing that we've enabled in the portal itself is this assemblies 
And so what we have is these .NET Framework assemblies need to live somewhere where they can be executed. And so in the portal itself, you'll see this under artifacts. There's three different types that show in this dropdown. We've got uh, uploads for like SDKs. So for doing uh, SAP development, you would upload your assemblies uh, for the SDK. For the ODBC connector, we can support jar files with JDBC. And then lastly, we've got these custom assemblies for .NET Framework. So you can go ahead, drag and drop and upload those essentially into this folder. And then underneath the hood, we have a file system where these assemblies are actually captured itself. If you're using VS Code, what you would do is create this same uh, folder structure as part of your project. And when you deploy it, the assemblies naturally go with it itself. So with our assembly uploaded, we can now go ahead and upload an XSLT file. As I mentioned before, this is something where we don't need to tweak the underlying XSLT. So I'm just showing you here, there's no import statements, uh, nothing that I've had to modify in order for this XSLT file to go ahead and call that .NET Framework assembly. And then naturally, if you have your inline C-sharp, uh, that will continue to work uh, as it did in BizTalk. So this is something I can go ahead and just upload into the maps folder. Once again, if you're in VS Code, you've got an artifacts maps folder there as well. And then when it comes to go ahead and to call this, uh, you'll still use the transform XML action. And you will know that the extension object support has landed in your region, in your subscription, when you see that XML, uh, that extension object XML property that has been exposed on the action itself. And so otherwise, you'd go ahead and call this XSLT file, much like you would any other. Now, when it comes to the contents there of that XML extension object property, that's where you just go into the file that BizTalk provided you with, just copy and paste the whole thing. Uh, if you have multiple uh, you know, assemblies being referenced, that's fine. Just copy the entire contents and then go ahead and paste it into that specific action. And so when you load this for the first time, you'll click that drop down, you'll see it because it is an optional parameter itself. And so here, what I'm doing is I'm just going to show you the extension object XML file. So this is that file that's generated from BizTalk when you validate a map. And really what it is, it's that, you know, a path or a, an assembly name for the helper method and assembly that you've called from BizTalk. And so now all I'm going to do is just go ahead and submit a request from Postman. The assembly itself isn't doing anything too crazy. It's going to just uh, prepend some text in that band field that you see there as well. And uh, we'll know that the assembly has been called uh, if we see the existence of SP dash before the, the band number. And I think that's pretty much it, Wagner. We can uh, go ahead and jump to the next slide. All right, another feature that uh, recently has been released, and you should see this worldwide at this point, is metrics. And so this is Logic App Standard, of course. Now, I've had a question online about this. Is this available in consumption, or when is this coming to consumption? And so the answer is it already is there. So this is really more around like feature parity between standard and consumption. And what's what's good about metrics is that it provides some quick access to Logic App's performance and health. It's one of those things where you need to do like an ad hoc lookup to find out, you know, what's going on with a particular workflow. Uh, this is a great tool to go ahead and use. Now, if you're looking for like long-term retention, like that's where you want to use application insights or log analytics, where you can go look at historicals itself. Now, this is something that is enabled by default. It's not something you have to turn on. It's not something that you get charged uh, addition, any additional money for. And you can see the different metrics that are available here. Uh, so they're generally related to runs being completed, actions being completed, triggers being completed, and then any sort of job execution data itself. 
Now, the way this works is that you will always, you generally would select a completed, like runs completed, and then you can go ahead and filter or split based upon a workflow name or status. So if you wanted to find failures, uh, you'd be able to use that status field to reflect that. And then lastly, we can go ahead and pin this to uh, an Azure dashboard or also a workbook as well. So Wagner, we can jump ahead and uh, see a, a brief demo on this as well. All right, so to find this, uh, actually, sorry, before we get there. Uh, so what to generate some data for this particular scenario is I've created a, a logic app that contains errors. And then I'd let it run on a recurring basis where it'll go ahead and run and then fail. And, uh, and then we'll be able to take a look at failure data. And then also for a period of time, I you know fix the error and then let it run. And it was actually successful so that we can start to see the delta. Now, in terms of where do I find metrics, go into your left nav, look for monitoring, then click on metrics, and then you're going to see this experience here. So we've got our scope, which is our, our logic app, uh, which I've incorrectly spelled demo wrong. And then we've got the metric namespace, so that's going to be the default. And then we've got all of these different metrics that are available. Now, on the last screen, I showed you seven, and you're looking at this, and there's a long list. And so what are all these other ones? These are our existing metrics that are provided by app service. So these are there to supplement what we provide, but what we've added is really these uh, items, these metrics that begin with the word workflow, and those are going to be specific to Logic Apps itself. And so we've got the ones that I discussed on the on the previous slide. Now we're also going to have a series of aggregations, so we can go ahead and figure out what do we want to actually represent from that perspective, whether it's a sum, a count, a min, a max, etc. Probably could have uh, shortened this up a little bit. Now, some people might be wondering what does dispatched mean? And so dispatched is, is actually quite interesting when you think about concurrency. So perhaps you've got some sort of concurrency or flow control and you have essentially requests that are queued up, like queued up internally um, because you want to only process so many workflows at a time. And so when we say dispatch count, what that actually reflects is a message that had been previously been queued, but has since been executed. Uh, and so that's sort of a distinction. If you have some of those patterns, that's where that, uh, that metric might help you out determining where, what's the overall state of those. I don't know if this is stuck or not. I think the animation might be stuck. There we go. Okay. Okay. Okay, we're almost ready to move on. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> I hope everyone has these memorized by now. Uh, well, there's a test at the end. Okay, so uh, now what we can see is uh, workflow runs completed. We've got the different aggregations. Um, here, I'm just going to go ahead and use some. And we can look over a period of time. In this case, it's going to be the past 24 hours. And we can see the runs completed. Now, these would include both successful and failures, um, because at this point we haven't gone ahead and done any splitting or filtering. Uh, so these would represent all workflows. And that's the important thing, all workflows within an actual logic app itself. And so naturally you're gonna wanna be able to like slice, slice this up. And one of the ways that we can go ahead and do that is by applying splitting. 
Now, so we're going to go ahead and split based upon workflow name. And uh, then what we can now see is the breakdown of the various workflows that have executed um, basically within that logic app over our prescribed uh, time frame, in this case, 24 hours. Now, if I'm trying to find failures, this might not give me the sort of the interest that I'm or the information that I'm looking for, but that's where I can go ahead and do some subsequent uh, filtering as well. And I think this becomes particularly useful. You know, we always get those questions of like, you know, maybe it's your manager or a stakeholder that says, oh, how many times did this particular workflow run on a specific date? Um, and you could like, you know, you could go into a lot, you know, app insights, or you could look, go into run history and hopefully you're not manually, you know, counting all of those instances, but to be able to go into metrics and to be able to do something simple like this um, is, is quite useful. Uh, and then here, like I said, if you wanted to reuse that, uh, sir, a query, you could go ahead and pin it, uh, pin to Grafana, you could uh, add it to a workbook, et cetera. So those are some other options as well. Uh, so now what I want to go ahead and do is I want to split uh, based upon status. So this is where I'm going to start to see like the differences between successful executions and failed executions. And I can see because of the splitting that I've got a particular workflow, um, you know, I've got some workflows that are failing. So now I can go ahead and drill deeper into that to figure out what are my workflows that are actually failing. And so that's... Um, I think useful as well as you start to split these out. Okay, so we'll close on that. Now let's go take a look at the filters. So we can add a filter. And then once again, we can uh, filter on workflow name. So we know that uh, the workflow that's causing all the headache is this uh, my flow that contains errors. And once again, this is where we see all of the executions, but we can subsequently add additional filters that allow us to go ahead and filter on uh, status, in this case, failed. Because I think that's naturally the question that you're going to get asked is, okay, at what time did this particular workflow start, start to fail? And you know, once again, you can easily go ahead and figure out that timestamp just by doing some simple exploration inside of the metrics uh, feature here itself. So I think that's probably good, Wagner. I think uh, we can jump to the next one just in the interest of time. I think that uh, summarizes what uh, what we're trying to achieve. Now, the, the next one that uh, customers have been asking a fair bit about is uh, diagnostic settings. And when can we expect this? Uh, once again, this is more of a, a feature parity thing. Uh, this is something that's existed inside of consumption where a uh, customer can go ahead and choose to export telemetry to uh, Azure Monitor. And, and that can include like log analytics workspace um, or to a storage account or stream to an event hub or to a partner solution itself. And so you now can set this up inside of Azure Logic App Standard. You do want to enable the workflow runtime logs uh, kind of similar to what we saw with metrics uh, because uh, we do share uh, some platform components with other services such as functions. We can also supplement uh, the information by enabling the function application logs. But once again, if we want to focus just on workflow related items, we would just enable workflow runtime logs. Now we can see the events that are captured here on the left-hand side. We've got workflow run started, workflow run completed, uh, workflow trigger started and ended, action started and ended, and then also batch messages. So if you're using the batch feature, you can also get some additional telemetry based on that. And then, of course, people generally use these features with track properties or custom tracking IDs. And uh, that's also something that is, is available here as well. So let's go ahead and jump into the, the demo, Wagner, please. So it's a very simple workflow just to help demonstrate the scenario. Uh, request response. And uh, naturally, as part of our request, we can go ahead and include a custom tracking ID. So if we click on settings, we can see that we've got some payload that we're going to parse. In this case, we're going to pull out an order ID as part of that request payload. And that's something that we'll be able to track. Uh, the other thing that's important for folks is track properties. So I've got an HTTP action. 
And here I've just hard coded a value, but of course you can go ahead and use an expression here uh, to make this dynamic. And when we go ahead and execute this workflow, naturally uh, the other events that we talked about, like action completed, trigger completed, workflow completed will be tracked, but we'll also be able to capture this data as well. Okay, so now what we're gonna go ahead and do is just take a look at where we can find diagnostic settings. So once again, in left nav, head over to the monitoring area, click on diagnostic settings. I've already pre-configured my instance to use Log Analytics Workspace, but uh, what you would do is click on this add diagnostic setting, and then you can choose one or more different destinations uh, based upon your needs. And then also you would include the workflow runtime logs, and then optionally the function application logs as well. And if you want to choose you know, more than one, you, you're certainly welcome to just all based upon your needs and, and what you're trying to achieve with it. Now, one thing I did notice when I did enable this and I did validate this with the Azure Monitor team, it does take approximately 30 minutes for the first events to, to arrive inside of Log Analytics. After the first set of events, then it's something that you can expect usually within one to two minutes, the data is, is usually, uh, usually there. So now where I'm at, I'm in Azure Monitor, I've chosen my logs, uh, feature and I'm in my log analytics workspace. Here I've just gone ahead and uh, queried the logic app workflow runtime table sorted by start time descending and then took the first 10. Here we can see those various uh, events being captured, whether it's like the workflow run started, the workflow run completed, and then the various action and triggers being completed as well. Uh, something you will know is like there's generally two records per event, and that's to represent the start of the event and the end of the event. And it's one of those things where we do have to do it that way because if you had a long running event, especially a workflow that could run over the course of a couple of days, uh, you wouldn't actually see that event appear until it actually completed, which would uh, be misleading. And so that's why we do have the two different events and that at least lets you know when there's an event that could still be running, perhaps like a, a long running action or a long running workflow itself. Here's some of the data that you can expect to see in the various events, like the run ID, which you can go ahead and plug into run history uh, if you need to follow the breadcrumbs. Uh, we've got that client tracking ID that's been surfaced as well. Uh, you can see like the end time where you have an end time, you can expect to see a status, uh, which would you know reflect either succeeded or failed. Where you have those started events, that's where the status will be running. Um, because like at the time it was running, we don't know if it's completed yet or not. So you do depend on or rely on the completed event as opposed to the started event for duration. Now, if we scroll over, we can see some of the additional fields uh, that are captured here. Status code, you know, is another important one if you wanted to key off of that to uh, represent status for completed events as well. Uh, if there was an error, you would see it reflected in that particular column. Uh, workflow name is naturally important. Uh, action name would be interesting as well if you wanted to query for specific actions. You can now see beside it the client tracking ID. So that's something that even though it's captured at the trigger, it's reflected throughout all of the events. So if you want to query just for that tracking ID, that's useful to bring back all of the events. And then what we'll see here shortly is for actions where track properties have been enabled, uh, we'll go ahead and see those values show up there as well. So this is uh, something that I think is beneficial for customers in terms of being able to get more telemetry. Uh, naturally with Azure Workbooks, you can create custom uh, dashboards and reports off of all of this information 
as well. And so this is available, um, you know, GA or sorry, this is available in preview, but it's available worldwide. So uh, feel free to go ahead and take a look. And Wagner, we could probably jump ahead just in the interest of time. I think that's uh, pretty much it. All right. So let's now pass to, to Alex to talk a little bit about Data Mapper and, and how it's looking like and how it's shaping. Yeah. So I'm excited to update you all on Data Mapper, which is our upcoming new mapping tool experience with improved visualization for schemas in modern integration workflows. So at the current moment, the Data Mapper tool is only available in VS Code, but we do have plans to support, to support Data Mapper in Azure Portal in the near future. A quick note also is that Data Mapper will be also available for both consumption and standard, but for now our priority is standard. Um, we also currently support XML transformations, but we plan to add additional support for JSON and CSV in Data Mapper's future GA release. Um, and also a note is that currently Data Mapper has not yet been released for public preview, but stay tuned because we're targeting a spring release and we're excited to share some more updates with you next month. And so, like I said, at the current moment, it's only available in VS Code, so we want to give you a sneak peek of current progress. And so we'll kind of dive into the next slide so we can expand a bit <clears throat> and take a look. So one of the really nice things about Data Mapper is that we provide a pre-built functions library, not to be confused with Azure Functions, uh, that includes categories like string and logical operators. Um, and additionally, the elements of the data map are part of a drag and drop experience between the schemas. And you can easily configure your function's pro um, properties, such as input values, et cetera, by clicking on it to display the properties panel down below. Additionally, we will also have a built-in map test experience so you can easily run from the data mapper, as well as a code view. But a note also is that our code view is currently read-only, but we do have plans to enhance this feature and provide some more custom extensibility. All right. So, okay, I think I said uh, showing some of the, I might be clicking something sorry. in the wrong places. <laughs> no, yeah. sorry, that was me responding to one of the questions in chat, sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, uh, I think we have some questions here not sure if you added, uh, uh, if we added, uh, yes, of course we didn't add a, a Q and A, a slide is our, our first one. So what we can do now is just go and let's go and go through some of the questions that we have there and started to uh, answer some of those, right? So I think the first one, I'll go, go in order here, but I'll just pick up the, 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 the ones that is going to be, uh, uh, more related to, to what we have here. So the first one is from uh, uh, Tum. He was asking if the file uh, uh, connector is going to be uh, available outside the ASC2, right? So currently we have a dependency on the uh, uh, App Services team to, to the, like, uh, uh, be able to allow this for the file connector to be, the, uh, to be used outside the ASC. Right, there are some restrictions in in terms of the uh, networking for that. So we're working together with them, but we don't have a timeline for that one yet. Hopefully that uh, that answer the the question. Then next one is from uh, uh, Jojo, and he say, does the export functionality exports the extension objects? So. I'm assuming that this is a, 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 you're talking about the export tool that we have, and if that is going to be exporting the extension objects as well. Um, we are, I, I needed to check on that one, but I think it's a, a, what we're doing with the export tool for XML, we're exporting the, XM, the, the, the XSLT file that we have available there, right? So I don't think we're exporting the custom objects yet. Because that was uh, 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 that one is just being uh, released. But if that's the case, and if we have scenarios for that, we make an updating on on the export tool to support that at a later stage. 
So next one I think is for you, the, the, uh, Kent. Uh, someone was asking, like, how would it be possible to upload the assemblies, right? The, the, the ones that we show for customer uh, uh, objects through an AZDO pipeline or GitHub action. Yeah, and so the, the way to think about this is you can have steps in your pipeline like that have build events. And that's really what we have uh, today, like in, well, the custom code stuff that we'll talk about down the road is essentially being able to go ahead and compile the assemblies and then being able to bin place them. And then as part of, once they're bin placed, the ability then to just basically copy those files over. And so they just need to be in the correct folder in the project structure itself um, as it's actually being moved over. So you can kind of think of those assemblies much like an XSLT file or much like an XSD. The, the, but naturally you don't want to uh, have like those bin place, those assemblies uh, already compiled and in source code. So what you would do as part of your build task is as a pre, like a prior step, go ahead and do that compilation and then bin place the assembly into the correct folder. And mm -hmm. then as part of your regular process, have that move along, um, you know, to, to Azure itself. And so even if we do like a VS code type uh, deployment, you just go right mouse click deploy to logic app. It just moves along because of that folder structure. If you're going to do it in ADO, naturally, you would just do that a step before where you go ahead and retrieve the source code, do a .NET build, then basically bin place the assembly just before you go ahead and deploy the project. Yeah. From the logic app's standard point of view, it's just a binary, right? So it's, it's just it's just a file that needs to be on the right place in the structure for us to zip and push, Correct. right? So we can do steps before to support that relatively easy. Correct. Cool. I think that's the one that, uh, 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 no, I don't think uh, uh, might be one of the, the ones from Mustafa that you were uh, uh, trying to answer. But first question that he has, he has a couple of questions here. Is there any public Grafana dashboard to track uh, uh, Logic Apps metrics? Rather than create a separate dashboard for Logic Apps, we, Grafana can let us uh, uh, select the Logic Apps and use that same template. So not, we, haven't, we haven't done anything in this area yet, but um, this would be where I think it would be great to see the community come together in terms of like publishing something that could be shared and perhaps even hosted like the templates hosted in GitHub or something like that. So uh, we have done some more like exploration around like workbooks and, and Grafana has definitely come up. Uh, there's a managed Grafana service in Azure. That's uh, a team, a sister team of ours that uh, works on that, but um, nothing specific yet, but I feel like this is where uh, the community coming together and publishing something that, uh, you know, provides a lot of value would be quite interesting to collaborate. And, and certainly we'd be happy to, to get involved in that as well. And I saw this like uh, uh, when you uh, navigate navigating, that is the option to pin to Grafana. So you probably should be able to, to like work on that and create that template one time. And after that, uh, I started to, to reuse this. Correct, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So next one, I think is still from uh, uh, Mustafa. Like, is it possible to list down the fail execution run IDs or the identifiers by using those new metrics? Like a grid view to show the, the, the uh, on the grid view, you're just showing the count. Yeah, and uh, this was the one I had responded to. Um, so yeah, that's, I would say App Insights or Log Analytics is the better place to be able to do this. Uh, we're not getting into that level of detail in metrics itself. Basically to filter or to split, it's either on status or on workflow name itself. So um, being able to do like querying based on run IDs, you sh will be in, end up in, uh, in Log Analytics or App Insights. And finally, the uh, one from uh, Michael Sens. Hi, Mike. Uh, origin run ID in the logs. Is that the calling logic apps in cases when uh, we use several logic apps in a flow? Yeah, so this is similar to App Insights. We've got this notion of dependencies tables. So you can kind of think of it much like that, where you've got um, you know, one service that's calling another service and you know, being able to track that. All right. Um, some another question here. I think this one is for for you, Alex. Uh, uh, how will large schemas be handled? I can imagine that it will get quite confusing when looking at the overview of the data map. 
Yeah, so I can speak a bit on that with uh, what we're kind of thinking about as we kind of head into public preview. Uh, we do have a plan for having an overview view. So being able to zoom out and then zoom back in easily to kind of be able to skip through different parts of your schemas. Um, as well as in terms of views, we are planning on being able to have different icons so that you are able to differentiate um, between the different pieces, as well as some sort of way to distinctly define uh, the kind of connections between all the different elements. Awesome. Thank you. Um, there is a, as David said, a totally unrelated a, a question, but there are plans to remove the .NET 3.1 dependency in VS Code Designer. It makes a, a use of M1 and M2 Max less than an ideal experience and it's uh, uh, x64 only. I have the impression that uh, uh, with the update for function for functions v4, we're removing that uh, uh, dependency on the extension. But we can follow up with you that uh, offline, David, and you can reach out uh, uh, reach out to us either on Twitter or uh, uh, on our emails just to make sure if the, uh, that's working. The other point to make is that the new designer that is currently in public preview on the, the uh, on the portal is soon also started the public preview in uh, uh, VS Code. And I'm pretty sure that that one doesn't have any dependency on .NET 3.1. And just a quick comment here at the, uh, from Mike at the, uh, back on, on the feature that was just showing. Kent looks like the, uh, people is really enjoying that. Cool. I think there was uh, one other question that we may have missed around uh, what is the code view on the mapper? Is it XSL yeah. or XML? There we go, from, uh, uh, from Jojo. So what is the code view on the mapper? Is XSLT for XML and Liquid for JSON? Do you want me to take this one, Alex? OK. Uh, so uh, <laughs> this, so, OK, so this is it. I'm trying to figure out how to phrase this. So what we do have is um, essentially metadata. So when we talk about the aspirations for the, the mapper, we want to support like any to any format. So we talked a little bit about XML and JSON and, and CSV. And so what we do is we've got like a, a YAML file that describes essentially the schemas that are involved in a particular data transformation. Plus it also uh, references essentially paths like within the, the document itself. And so the code view at, at this point is basically a representation of that YAML file that it provides that intermediary. And it's kind of this intermediary is kind of important. It's kind of like an abstraction because it does allow us to work across all of these different data formats. Uh, so for today, it'll tell you exactly what are the schema's references, what are the paths between the nodes that are being uh, mapped. And um, you know, down the road, like as we support more file types, um, you'll be able to sort of see what's happening underneath the hood from that perspective. So uh, for now it is read only, but we are um, uh, discussing what we can do from a write perspective and also understanding scenarios for when people would want to use a code view versus uh, using the visual mapper itself. Uh, so that, that's feedback we're, we're keenly interested in because uh, code view does come up quite frequently, but we'd love to understand how people want to use that. Cool. And finally, I think uh, another unrelated question and adding that one for the, uh, full transparency because I don't have the answer for that one right now. But Israel is asking if uh, the, uh, uh, when the 300,000 high throughput limit will become GA, right? So the, uh, I know that we are having chats about that one, Israel, and I'll, I'll, make, I'll try to find out uh, more about that and reach out to you. But I don't have that answer right now. I think we got through all the questions. I think that's it. So if there is no the, uh, other questions, then uh, uh, I think that's us for today. Really good to, to get in those ones back and uh, uh, see you guys next month. Yeah, thanks all for joining. Mm -hmm.